Hi everybody, it's Mr. Matthew here again for a biology video, this time on cell compartmentalization. And so specifically we're going to be looking at uh, how cells compartmentalize into smaller environments, and then also a little bit about how that has an impact on uh, biological structure and function. So let's get to it. So first up, let's talk about membrane bound structures in eukaryotic cells. And so uh, you will recall that uh, we often divide cells into uh, those that have a nucleus. Those are eukaryotic cells and those that do not have a nucleus which we call prokaryotic cells. Now, that classification is a little dated because we know that not all cells that uh, lack a nucleus really go into <clears throat> the same clade or same grouping, um, but they're still useful categorizations or uh, descriptors that we like to throw on cells. So when we look at a uh, eukaryotic cell, we will find that there's a handful of structures that are going to be found within uh, the cell, including uh, ribosomes, where proteins are made, um, also some components of the cytoskeleton, uh, the microtubules, the microfilaments, the intermediate filaments, um, and so forth, that are going to be uh, just structures that are not necessarily membrane bound, they'll be found inside the cell. But aside from that, nearly all of the other structures that are found inside cells are going to be membrane bound. So we will find that the nucleus is going to have a membrane that surrounds the nuclear material. We will see find endoplasmic reticulum, both rough and smooth, the rough having ribosomes attached to it and the smooth not having that. We will also end up seeing uh, vacuoles, uh, which will contain other materials in them. Uh, we will see uh, organelles such as mitochondria and chloroplasts, uh, which have their own uh, complex membrane structures around them. Uh, and then there's various other structures like Golgi apparatus and peroxisomes and lysosomes and those type of things that you can find inside cells. And all of these have in common that there is a uh, lipid bilayer, at least one of them, surrounding these structures that allow for there to be a separate environment inside this organelle that is separate from the cytoplasm that is the fluid matrix of the cell. And so why do we talk about these? Well, membranes and membrane-bound organelles in eukaryotic cells allow there to be specific metabolic processes and specific enzyme reactions that take place within those cells. And so you may recall from uh, discussions previously of enzymes that an enzyme is a type of protein that helps to uh, facilitate a chemical reaction by lowering the activation energy, um, specifically their biological catalysts that will take a substrate and turn it into products either by um, taking two molecules and putting them together or taking a large molecule and breaking down to smaller components. And what we know is that different uh, enzymes have different structures. They're made up of amino acids, and those amino acids will fold up depending on the environment. As a result, if we go to different locations, we will find that different enzymes will have different activity at varying pHs or other environmental uh, situations, so temperature is another uh, case that we sometimes see, sometimes salinity is another uh, component. Um, so what we can see here over on the left is that if we were to graph, we would see this blue line might represent the enzyme activity of one type of enzyme, one that worked really well in an acidic environment. The uh, yellow-orange line in the middle uh, would be something that is going to be in a very neutral environment, and the green would be something that would work very well in a basic environment. Um, again, this is one of the factors that would be there. Other factors could, again, involve uh, salinity or other uh, environmental factors that would influence the shape and the activity of that. Uh, specific uh, set of enzymes. And so what we can find is that when we look inside the uh, cell, what we'll find is that the different locations, so we'll notice that the nucleus has a, a pH of 7.3, as does the endoplasmic reticulum and the cytosol, uh, but what we'll find is that the Golgi apparatus has a pH that is a little bit lower. And so it's likely that the enzymes that work inside the Golgi apparatus are going to function slightly differently than those that are in the endoplasmic reticulum. Similarly, the lysosomes are even more acidic and we know that they have lots of digestive enzymes and so those digestive enzymes will work really 
really well inside the lysosome, but might not work so well in the, the cytosol. Similarly, you'll see the mitochondria will have a pH where the matrix of the mitochondria um, is going to have a pH of 8, but the inner membrane space is a 7.1. And so there's actually a difference of hydrogen concentration where it's more acidic in the inner membrane space and more basic in the matrix. Um, and that's going to allow for two separate environments separated by a membrane. And so oftentimes what we're seeing is that membranes allow us to isolate sets of reactions or sets of conditions that will be optimal for whatever function is going to take place in that particular area. That's really the major point of compartmentalization, allowing for specific locations where specific environments will have different functions taking place that allow the cell to work cooperatively and cohesively to accomplish all of its functions. So, Let's talk about how those internal membranes and membrane-bound organelles contribute to that compartmentalization of a eukaryotic cell function. So let's talk about one specific example here, and that would be uh, the making of a protein that would be secreted by the cell. And so what we know is that the information for how to make a protein would be found inside the nucleus. So the DNA is going to contain the information for how to make that protein. That information will be uh, transcribed into a messenger RNA. That messenger RNA would leave the nucleus and go out to the rough endoplasmic reticulum and specifically would interact with one of the ribosomes on that rough ER and turn into a uh, a polypeptide chain. So a polypeptide chain is going to be a long string of amino acids that has the capacity to turn into a specific protein. It's going to be turned into a, or put out by that ER in a transport vesicle, but it's not going to be the final form of that specific protein. It's going to be a long chain and it's still going to need to be folded up and modified. It's also going to need to know where to ultimately go as a result. And so it will then move over to the Golgi apparatus. And at the Golgi, it's going to get modified at the Golgi into a finalized form. And that finalized form will then be put into a secretory vesicle that could be then secreted out of the cell. <clears throat> in this particular instance, it happens to be a protein that is going to be embedded within the membrane, but it could be a protein that would be secreted by the cell and expelled by the cell into an extracellular space, um, either going into like a circulatory system, if they were talking about something like a, in a large organism like a human, um, or it could be out of the, in, into the environment if we're looking for say a communication between uh, unicellular organisms. And so what we see here is that by having a series of stages, we're going to have different functions by these different organelles. Uh, they're going to work in concert to ultimately produce a functioning protein that has been folded up and modified and has all of the properties that are necessary for proper functioning in the appropriate location uh, for optimal survivability of this organism. All right, so we're going to take a moment here and we're going to pause and think. And I'm going to give you a really simple question, but uh, there's a little bit of complexity to it. And so uh, I've got a diagram here and I want to know what will happen to the molecules in this diagram below. And so we can see these little blue molecules up here on the top, and we can see this lipid bilayer that is here. And I'm going to have time progress, and I want to know what you think is going to happen here. I also want you to think about, will it require energy input from the cell in order for those molecules to move to someplace else? And then also I want to know, are there situations in which a cell could harness the energy from the phenomenon that's going to take place. So take a moment and I want you to pause and think. All right, so hopefully you've had a chance to pause and think. And so what I want to do now is see what happens. And so what I'm going to show you here is a situation in which whatever this little blue substance is, it is not blocked by our lipid bilayer. So what that means is that it is uh, small, it's likely uncharged, it's something that could easily get through this hydrophobic core of this membrane, um, and it's just a molecule that could move easily across a membrane. You should have said that you would see diffusion of those blue molecules from an area of high concentration to low concentration if the molecules are not blocked by the membrane. Now you very easily could have said, wait, well, the molecules are too big or maybe they're charged and therefore they're going to stay in one location and that they could only move to the other side if they were allowed to go through 
something like a channel protein that would allow them to move uh, from the area of high concentration to low concentration. And so what you should have said is that there's no energy input necessary from the cell for molecules to go from an area of high concentration to low concentration, although in some instances they do need to have a channel protein to facilitate or help with that. Now, if you do set up a situation here and these blue molecules are large or charged and you set it up so that that transport channel is something like an ATP synthase, that allows that as those large or charged molecules move from an area of high concentration to low concentration, they are going to allow you to put together or phosphorylate a molecule. You could couple the natural kinetic energy of diffusion of those blue molecules from high concentration to low concentration, and you could couple that with the formation of an ATP. And so we actually see that in many different environments, and we'll talk about that, the use of ATP synthase and the diffusion of molecules to power the making of ATP as it takes place both in chloroplasts and in mitochondria. Uh, we won't do both of those today, although I'll, I'll touch upon it a little bit because it does play into our compartmentalization role, specifically as it applies to the mitochondria. So again, internal membranes facilitate the cellular processes by uh, minimizing competing interactions and by increasing surface area where reactions can occur. So one big thing that you could do is that if I, I want to have a set of enzymes that are in a particular location, rather than taking enzymes and putting them out into the entire um, environment of the cell um, and therefore having them fairly diffuse, if I want to make sure that my substrates and my enzymes are going to interact in a particular location, if I put them into a compartmentalized membrane, that is really going to increase the interactions between them. It's going to re reduce the competition uh, for those molecules to bind to those specific enzymes, and it's going to really increase the reaction rate that I have. Additionally, I have the ability to increase surface area. And so I mentioned the mitochondria before. So what we know is that um, along that inner mitochondrial membrane, we're going to have the electron transport chain. And so by having lots of folds, and you can see here on this diagram that there's a lot of folds of this inner membrane, these are referred to as cristae, um, it really increases the surface area. So I can actually have lots and lots and lots of locations inside the mitochondria where we can have this electron transport chain take place. So I've increased the surface area, so now I've increased the location for the re these reactions. Additionally, because we have set up all of these folds and we've set up this inner membrane, outer membrane, as mentioned earlier, we have two separate environments. We have an environment in this inner membrane space where we can have lots of hydrogens get concentrated in this location. And then we can l let those uh, go through only through one specific channel protein, which we know is an ATP synthase. And by doing that, we are going to allow these separated environments to actually power the making of ATP. So you can see how by compartmentalizing, we are both setting up a situation where we have lots of surface area, where lots of the reactions we want to take place, and we are separating these environments into different locations, creating a uh, dynamic location where the disequilibrium can create an opportunity for cells to produce energy. And so lots of stuff going on in here with membranes, um, and that compartmentalization is key to all of those factors that we've discussed. The improving the likelihood of enzymes and substrate to react and increasing with surface areas for those reactions to occur and also unique environments that can be separated to really maximize differences of environment for optimizing reactions. All right. Well, I hope that was helpful and I will talk to everybody soon.